to the Global Leaders Investment Summit. We've got a great program for you today, and we're going to be looking at the impact of a new industrialization, the new economy, the next, if you desire, industrial revolution. So we'll be discussing topics such as how will this new industrial industrialization affect international investment? What are the best scenarios for this new industrialization to support sustainable development goals? And what can the United Nations contribute to maximize the positive and minimize the negative impact of this new industrialization? Now, I'm delighted to have this panel of distinguished speakers joining us today. And may I open this summit by asking Dr. Makisa Kituya, the Secretary General of UNCTAD, to give his opening remarks at the rostrum. Thank you. Your Excellencies, Heads of State, leaders of international corporations, distinguished members of this eminent panel, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may I bid you all welcome, on behalf of UNCTAD, to the second investment summit of 2018 Forum. As you remember last, yesterday, we talked in depth and with very different perspectives on the challenges faced by, uh, by globalization and how it impacts on our strategies for achieving Agenda 2030. In identifying the barriers to investment and threats to the multilateral system, we set the ground for very rich onward discussions, the different sessions that have been held and will continue to be held through Friday. Today, we would like to discuss the challenges as, as well as opportunities that arise from the new forms of industrialization, particularly what is being touted as the fourth industrial revolution, and how this can contribute to sustainable development, and particularly how the impact the dynamics of investment. The pace of innovation and technological challenge it changes is altering the way in which goods and services are designed, produced, transported, and consumed globally. It has been referred to as the fourth industrial revolution, or Industry 4.0. This will have profound and far-reaching implications for trade, investment, and development, especially for the developing countries. Rapid breakthroughs in emerging technologies, such as robotics, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, 3D printing, quantum computing, energy, energy storage and blockchain, are setting the stage for the transformation of economic activity as we know it today. The conflation of technologies across physical, digital and biological spheres is opening up new possibilities for manufacturing, while at the same time, swiftly rendering existing production mechanisms redundant. It has become imperative to assess how this will impact sustainable development in, in a proactive, far-sighted, and coordinated approach by all the stakeholders. The impact of digitalization and increased connectivity has already had an impact on investment patterns and value chains. International production is shifting gradually from tangible cross-border production networks to intangible value chains. Digital MNEs and tech MNEs are now 15 of our anchored top 100 multinationals, up from four in the year 2010. They have a relatively light international production configuration because they can reach foreign markets with limited assets and small numbers of employees overseas. Another metric reported by UNCTAD shows that the level of investment in greenfield projects in manufacturing has been consistently lower in the last five years than in the preceding five-year period across all development regions. Developing countries have, have traditionally 
targeted labor-intensive manufacturing and industrialization as the path to create jobs, increase incomes, and progress up the economic development ladder. In this endeavor, countries have put an emphasis on attracting foreign investment by multinational enterprises, integrating into global value chains, and gradually moving into higher value activities. However, in the context of the new industrialization, it is useful to review this strategy. With trade flows suppressed by FDI, and FDI still not returned to the pre-crisis peak, traditional development paths based on export manufacturing and FDI may be insufficient to meet the employment needs of developing countries and elevate deep-seated structural inequalities. The inability of many developing countries to capture value from new intangible modes of international production reduces the room economic, economies have to upgrade to higher value added activities. Additionally, it can further limit government fiscal revenues due to the greater difficulties in collecting tax from the international production and trade of intangibles. That said, the new age of industrialization also presents significant opportunities for developing countries, especially in terms of prospects for leapfrogging. For example, in the same way that many countries bypassed fixed line telephones network with mobile phones, Developing countries can use new technology to bypass traditional financial systems and increase access to financial services. Increased connectivity and artificial intelligence can also help exporters through trade facilitation and supply chain management, as well as enabling small companies to internationalize. Now, the role of the multinational system, multilateral system in helping developing countries adjust to the demands of the new industrialization and ensuring that it supports rather than impedes the SDGs is of paramount importance to us here today. We had entered as the focal point supporting member states to design and implement effective investment policies that can help the adaptation to the demands of rapidly evolving global economy are encouraged by your participation in this forum. With this broad outline in mind, I want to invite the eminent panelists here today to consider an, a few key questions in addition to the issues that they want to bring to us. One, how will the new industrialization affect international investment and its relation to development? Two, what are the best possible scenarios for new industrialization to support the SDGs and what are the main means to realize them? And three, what can the United Nations do to contribute to maximize the positive and minimize the negative impact of new industrialization on investment for development? I'm very glad to have such an eminent team with us and to have such an eminent moderator of the session. <laughs> and with those remarks, I want to bid you all welcome for the start of this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now uh, start with our panel, and I would like to introduce the President of Armenia, Mr. Armen Sarkisian, to take the rostrum. Thank you. Mr. Secretary General, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, of course it's great pleasure and great honor for me to be present today and uh, address this very prominent audience and talk about issues that are very key to the future of my nation. I'll try to make it short, but to the point. The first part of my speech, I will try to call it with a, t name it with a title. Probably the title will be Rediscover Armenia, or the known and unknown of Armenian nation. Of course, it's known for, uh, for many of you and worldwide that Armenia is one of the uh, cradles of civilization. We are speaking about thousands of years in the uh, Mesopotamia, and we are speaking about a country that celebrated last week the 2,800th anniversary of its capital city, Yerevan, where I come from. It's also known that that civilization being a crossroad of 
of many civilizations, religions, interests, and also trade uh, was also a big part of cooperation between nations. But what is not known, I, I realized that, that, and I realized that recently when I was in New York and visited the Metropolitan Museum, there was a, there's a beautiful uh, exhibition there called Armenia. And I advise whoever will be in New York the upcoming th three, four months to visit that exhibition. It's organized by Metropolitan, showing Armenia, medieval Armenia, as a core component of the Silk Road. It's not only that Armenia was located on the Silk Road, but also that Armenians were working in Middle Ages from Manila, Manila Singapore, Bombay, to Samarkand, Bukhara, through Armenia to Lyon and Manchester. So it was a core component of the Silk Road. So this is the known Armenia and the unknown one that even me had discovered that in Metropolitan just a couple of weeks ago. It's also known recently that in Armenia we had a revolution in April. It was all over the BBC, Euronews, European organizations of media. After just a week after my inauguration, we had a crisis where there was a huge pressure on the government and the prime minister, newly elected prime minister, who was former president, resigned. And the leader of that opposition movement, or popular movement, became the next prime minister of in Armenia. So this is quite well known. The revolution, which was called in Europe and elsewhere the Velvet Revolution of Armenia, which was, we can be proud that we did a major change in our country, a transformation without bloodshed on confrontation in a very peaceful way, with huge demonstrations on the street, but no confrontation. That's a well-known Armenia. But there's another Armenia, which is unknown. Years ago in Armenia, the fourth industrial revolution or the digital revolution had started. Armenia today, we can say definitely, has the best IT sector if you take the former Soviet Union. And we have huge companies from Silicon Valley Europe having their presence in Armenia, and Armenia has close interaction and connection with, the, with all of the major centers of high tech and IT. So this is the unknown revolution that has happened in Armenia. And our nation has entered the era of the fourth industrial revolution and the era of the digital life, maybe earlier than some of other countries. So these are the known and unknown Armenians. Now, but why should someone, why should someone think about investing in a country like Armenia, which is a small country, only three and a half million population. But I would uh, like to remind that the, uh, the reality is it's a small state, but a global nation. There are four, five times more Armenians living abroad. There are, are as many Armenians living in Russian Federation as in Armenia. There are as many Armenians living in our capital city as in Los Angeles or in France, or in Middle East, or in Singapore, there are huge... So it's a small nation, but the, it's a small state, but a global nation, which in the 21st century is a great advantage. In the 21st century, the, the, the world is becoming smaller and smaller, interconnected, interactive, having a global network, one of the rare states and nations in the world that has this advantage. The second is that we are a state that has very good relations culturally, economically, politically, and we have signed in November last year an agreement with European Union, a deep agreement with European Union. In, in the meantime, Armenia is a part of Eurasia Economic Union. Factually, we are the only state that is building bridge between Eurasia economically and Europe, and we would like to continue this to happen. Third factor is the one that I said already, is that we are a global nation. And that global nation in the 21st century is completely involved with the country, in, involved in a way that even during the revolution, it was not a revolution of a classical style with a political party, organization, demonstration. It was something of 21st century after the rev industrial revolution. It was a revolution of Facebooks. And those who were participating were not only the citizens of the Republic of, of Armenia, but also those who lived in California, in Argentina, in France, 
in Britain or in, in Beirut or in uh, Armenians in Madras. So the whole Armenian nation, which is beyond 10, around 12 or 50 million, was engaged in the changes, political changes. But the same people can and will be engaged in the industrial revolution of Armenia and it will be engaged in the economic development of, of Armenia. The fourth reason that I would like to em emphasize the importance of education. It was known during the Soviet era that Armenia had very high level of education. It's, it's not an accident that except very good universities in the country, research centers on physics, chemistry, biology, small Armenia had an uh, electron positron accelerator and a world famous astrophysical center in Burakan. So that tradition continues now, and we are proud to say that we have fantastic centers of education in Armenia. Even we export new ideas and themes of education, even to the West. Just a couple of weeks ago in Paris, they opened a center which is called TUMO, an idea of giving extra school, outside school education in high tech and, and, and digital digital education, which is an avant-garde of 21st century, how you teach children to become an IT experts and how to use computers. It's a network in Armenia. It's a joint venture of someone that we're used to working in Intel, Armenian diaspora, and local armies with the government. So we export this now to Astana, we export now to, to, to Paris, tomorrow to, to St. Petersburg and Moscow and so on and so forth. Education matters here. And then, of course, stability of the economy. Last year, Armenia showed something around 7.5% uh, of growth. We had a revolution. This year, we're going to show more or less the same result. So nothing changed. There was a big change, political change, but the economy was stable. Armenia has probably the best financial and banking sector in the in the network of former Soviet republics. We have more than 20 banks, and they are representing banks from HSBC, Credit Agricole, other European ba banks, banks from Lebanon, banks from uh, Cyprus, uh, banks from Greece, Iran, and Med Med So it's an international banking sector, again very stable. During the revolution, huge crowds, hundreds of thousands of people on the street, usually un under the pressure of revolution, things are, will be happening where the banking sector, the financial values will uh, diminish or the, the national currency will suffer. No, not in the case of Armenia. Armenia is economically, financially stable country. And then when you look at the sectors of Armenia, be that the mining in copper, gold, uh, or, or ferromolybdenum, be that in agriculture, be that in tourism, if you take agriculture and mining, the government, the new government, the new Armenia is looking for sustainable and clean mining, sustainable, clean, natural agriculture. We are looking for increasing the tourism several times, and so on and so forth. So overall, if I try to bring this picture together, I am here to represent new Armenia, Armenia of 21st century, where this country is not only new with a new government or new leadership or new ideas, but also by spirit. I will call this revolution not only revolution, velvet revolution, but revolution of Armenian style and the development of the country. I will call it the new Armenia. I will name it young Armenia. Young in a, not in the number of the years of the age or something. Young by spirit. And the young by spirit means also participating in the Industrial Revolution. I will, will be happy to invite ladies and gentlemen to visit Armenia and to take part and invest in the new Armenia, Armenia of 21st centuries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I now ask the President of Botswana, Mkhwetsi Masisi, to the rostrum. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, moderator. Mr. Secretary General, distinguished excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. Let me express how delighted I am to be here um, participating in this summit held under the theme 
investment in a new era of industrialization. This theme is relevant and timely in view of how global manufacturing, the global manufacturing landscape and technological innovation have radically changed the way we transact business. I therefore wish to take this opportunity to share my perspectives regarding the new industrialization agenda and its impact on the developing nations like my very own in Botswana. And I will endeavor to answer some of the questions asked by the Secretary General. In recent years, we have observed, observed an increase among investors in the international arena who bring technology into industries. Technology requires huge funding across different sectors. And as a result, we find that industrialization brings its own sustainable development concerns, particularly with regard to inclusive growth and employment as a result of advanced manufacturing technologies. Nonetheless, we recognize that this new development in industrialization not only presents challenges, but also presents opportunities. As such, firms in developing countries may become new ent entrants to global competitive levels with the right technology for the production of goods and services thus benefiting our economies. St stability of, business, of the business environment would serve as a good facilitator to benefit from this kind of investment. Despite the vast opportunities presented by digitalization, developing countries have not yet fully realized the potential of harnessing digital technology for sustainable development due to, among others, inadequate ICT infrastructure, inadequate skills development, and socioeconomic barriers that prevent much of the developing world's population from engaging in the digital economy. Therein lies the first problem for the UN, Mr. SG. We have observed that the new industrialization agenda calls for a change in the way we view investment. We realize that this new concept presents a change in the competitiveness of nations to attract foreign direct investment. Accordingly, our strategic thinking in pursuit of investors will need to take this into consideration. Our regulatory environment will need to keep abreast with changes in investor behavior and the evolving landscape of advanced manufacturing and digital investors. It is in this regard that my government continues to review policies and legal framework, as well as institutions that are meant to respond to the evolving landscape of the new industrialization agenda. These are espoused both in our National Long-Term Vision 2036 and our National Development Plans. There are also diversification initiatives that are anticipated to usher in new products and diversify our gross domestic product. In this regard, there is need to, for benchmarks in the areas of physical regulatory, business to business, digital connectivity and supply-side connectivity, which are pivotal to the new industrialization agenda. For us, to achieve the intended results with the new industrialization agenda, it has become critical to develop partnerships with international development partners, as well as internationally renowned firms. And De Beers is one, I mean, just next to me here, is a good example. These will act as building blocks that will be complemented by the aspiring visions of national, regional, continental, as well as multilateral levels. Digital industrialization can create new types of jobs, new sectors, and new services. This could be of benefit in terms of creating the envisaged diversity, efficiency, and effectiveness in service provision. I trust that with all the ingredients in place, the attainment of the SDGs is not as far-fetched as we might imagine. Notwithstanding these, both the developed and developing and the least developed can economies should have mutual benefits as digitalization can have detrimental effects if not strategically implemented. It has come to my knowledge that implementation of this initiative will put jobs at risk due to computerization, automation, and robotics. And indeed, as we saw yesterday, the robotics of artificial intelligence may so do too. Likewise, countries who developed broadband infrastructure and e-skilled work workers, as well as widespread use of the internet and digital public services, are likely to be less threatened 
by digitalization than countries with a less developed digital infrastructure, meaning that developing economies with adequate ICT infrastructure are at risk. The fourth industrial revolution, therefore, uh, Madam Moderator, offers developing countries, especially in Africa, an opportunity to participate meaningfully in the global economy. Through its youthful and fastest growing population, the continent stands to benefit from the fourth industrial revolution, commonly referred to as our demographic dividend. According to the World Economic Forum, the, job, the Future Jobs Report 2016, more than one third of all jobs in all industries are expected to require complex problem solving as a core skill by 2020. It is against this backdrop that concerted efforts should be made to ensure that digitalization retools the available resources to ensure that it does not aggravate the youth unemployment which is ravaging the world at large with the developing and the least developed economies being the most affected. It is also worth noting that industrial strategy is targeting the new industrialization agenda are currently being taken on by developed nations and a few emerging economies, whilst in most developing countries, policies are unreservedly dealing with traditional industrial policies. Given the pace of technological development in industry, we are of the view that there is an urgent need not only to identify technological developments, but above all, to take stock of their short and long-term implications on current industrial strategies of developing countries. We therefore urge the United Nations to undertake an exercise to ensure that the adverse effects that may potentially arise out of these, this new development are minimized for developing countries. The exercise should assist us to harness opportunities which arise out of industrialization and to some extent for the UN to play a referee role in ensuring that those most developed play their part play the responsibility in ensuring that we attain the SDGs through investment. The new industrialization agenda is yet to be realized, as my government is still striving to bring in technological advancement through the implementation of the Botswana Industrial Policy and the SADC Industrialization Strategy and Roadmap. We hope that the new industrialization agenda will bring about changes that will enable the achievements of industrialization in Africa and create the much needed employment. I thank you most heartily. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I'd now like to invite the President of the Central African Republic, Professor Fusna Arkonj Touradera, to the rostrum. And uh, Monsieur Touradera will be speaking in French. So if your fl French isn't fluent, please use your headpieces. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Et mesdames, les chefs et de Ladies and gentlemen, heads of state Madame and government, Madam Chair, Madam President of the United Nations Monsieur General Secretary Assembly, General Secretary, Secretary General, General of the United Nations Conference le on Trade and Development, Excellencies, distinguished eminent persons, ladies and gentlemen. De Genève. The city of Geneva pour, uh, has welcomed us here today to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the World Investment Forum, which is a high-level platform with a special setting where international partners can discuss and think together about the ways and means of making investment ever more efficient and rendering it a true catalyst for development. We have been asked to come together to think about a very relevant topic for us today, investment in sustainable development. It is our task to promote development which is consonant with the needs of today without jeopardizing the abilities of future generations to meet their own needs. The fundamental objective 
objectives of sustainable development les are equality et les between nations, generations and individuals, environmental safety and economic efficiency. Et dans le de cette In the context de of this new era of globalization and industrialization, this topic à une prise de is a et call to arms in terms of an awareness raising amongst leaders in this world where we see industrialization very closely correlated to technological revolution. We have the 17 17 objectives of sustainable development, the sustainable development goals, which have to bridge gaps, which give rise to tension and conflict, such as the conflict experienced by my country, the Central African Republic. La République centrafricaine émerge d'un long cycle de crises marqué par des pics de violence qui ont ébranlé les fondements de l'État et détruit les infrastructures économiques. À ce jour, environ 80% de mes compatriotes vivent en dessous du seuil de pauvreté. 50% de la population a besoin d'assistance humanitaire. Needs humanitarian assistance. One Central African Republic citizen out of five is a displaced person or refugee. Over half of the health infrastructure is no longer functioning. Two percent only of my fellow citizens have access to safe drinking water and. Uh, about a quarter are Ainsi unemployed nous, or underemployed. Uh, about three quarters are unemployed or underemployed. Therefore, for us, investing in sustainable development recule. is ensuring that poverty is pushed back. Vaincue that hunger que les soins is de santé overcome, accessible. that health care should become que accessible, that education should be of the highest possible quality, that access to drinking water should become a reality for the largest possible number of people, that natural resources should be exploited in a rational manner, and that the environment should retain its balance and political institutions should be protected and developed so that we can generate further wealth. Le socle de tous ces of course, reste l'engagement all this must be underpinned by a commitment to bringing greater good governance, consolidation of peace, supporting resilience of communities, guaranteeing sustainable management of natural resources. Therefore, we have to make sure that public institutions are able to guarantee the principles of equality and justice and fair use of the national wealth. De cette manière que nous pouvons être de réels attraits pour drainer les capitaux et les investissements directs étrangers qui ne représentaient que 17 millions de dollars en 2017. Mesdames et messieurs, mû par la triple ambition pour mon pays, my country de gagner le pari de la must paix et de la achieve peace and security and reconciliation amongst our citizens and economic recovery. Landlocked developing countries such as mine usually attract very marginal investment because we have small markets and an unfavorable location. This situation is often aggravated by poor infrastructure, high transport costs, inefficient logistics, and low institutional capacity. But I have come here to Geneva today to tell you about investment opportunities in the Central African Republic. I've come to tell you that our weaknesses can be converted into strengths for inclusive development and shared prosperity. The agriculture sector 
also large pocket fishing, a great potential for investment opportunities. It contributes about half of GDP and provides jobs for about 80% of those in employment. We have arable, a fertile land, and a good climate. So our agricultural potential is about 15 million hectares. We have abundant rain un réseau hydrographique important et dense. And a dense network of rivers. So our agriculture is very promising in terms of profit, in terms of fruits, vegetables, uh, ground nuts, La République centrafricaine étant située dans une sous-région à forte activité pastorale, le développement d'une filière complète lait viande and avec toute we have de transformation meat et de industry with canning, de and this is a essential value-added factor for our livestock industry. Fisheries are also a fort potential de rentabilité dans very notre pays. Promising Doté in our country, we have a large hydrographic basin, Obangé in the nord, south and Chadje in the north, and these cover the entire territory. Investment in this sector is a business opportunity in terms of processing of the fish. This can give added value and a profitable market. We can also combat poverty under the SDG number one and number two uh, for uh, hunger in expanding the fishery sector. There is a further sector where private investors can make a profit in the short term. De pouvoir créer une structure de santé de référence en République centrafricaine pour améliorer la prise en charge de certaines pathologies country, et so introduire les techniques appropriées afin de traiter certaines maladies qui ne le sont pas actuellement en République centrafricaine. Nous ne saurions baser nos perspectives de développement Republic. sans mettre un accent particulier we sur la santé et le bien-être de nos concitoyens. And well-being of Ce our citizens. This sector requires private intervention. Their capital can be channeled through public-private partnerships and health sociale. insurance and social protection must also be implemented. And this is SDG number three. In terms of energy, the cost of hydroelectric dams are very high. Uh, so we need two dams as soon as possible through private partnerships so that we can provide energy to households and services to investors. However, there are alternatives which could be implemented, such as investment in clean renewable energy, which also is very profitable. The government of the Central African Republic has to work towards production of clean energy, construction of photovoltaic plant, and we have to provide high quality, affordable energy to our households at a great, greater scale so that this can be affordable to all. This is SDG number seven. It should be possible better to manage available energy by improving energy provision to industry and by reducing pollution, which comes from the use of energy. In terms of our infrastructure, to open us out to the world. Investors should help us to work on a plan to improve the navigability of the Ubangi River so that we can link up to the ports of Congo and the Democratic Republic of Congo so that we can have more supply routes for our country at a better 
price that outre, is SDG number nine. We have to discuss with investors capitaux, about channeling capital de into de gestion, recycling and waste management. This ODD. sector Ce is secteur covered by several SDGs and has être not une niche yet been addressed in valeur. our country, but it could be a high value niche messieurs, in our economy. Vous pas sans que Ladies la and gentlemen, I'm sure you're aware that the Central African Republic is reputed to have minières. a generous supply of natural and mineral resources. But if we are to transform our economy while the police developed economies, we have to turn also to the non-mining sector to create jobs and diversify production Aussi, and exports. We need to have a dialogue, dialogue on possible options de for achieving our development in these terms. À l'ère de la mondialisation et de la fulgurante expansion des nouvelles technologies, les investisseurs sont invités à explorer le champ vierge de la République centrafricaine. Je demeure persuadé que, grâce aux technologies, en recourant aux applications de l'intelligence artificielle, nous serons en mesure d'améliorer nos performances dans plusieurs domaines. Avec les projets, les projets d'aujourd'hui, assurer les technologies modernes nous permettrait de meilleures prestations dans le domaine de la santé avec les données géoréférencées pouvant faciliter la distribution de médicaments pour une meilleure prise en charge des maladies, pandémies et autres urgences. De la même manière, les possibilités offertes par l'impression 3D nous permettraient de produire des prothèses sur Sur mesure, which should sur enable us to produce artificial limbs in our own country. We've also seen experiences in many countries which show that technologies de can help with agricultural que production, water management, pour la production des troupeaux, and ainsi que livestock dans la grazing, des camps de personnes déplacées and réfugiés. help with displaced Mesdames, persons messieurs, and refugees. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I should like le vif intérêt to et say le souhait that we are very interested in the Central African Republic in continuing this discussion Ainsi, in Bangui. Je sollicite I would ask the Secretary General of UNCTAD to consider whether this is feasible and whether investors could be attracted to such a meeting so that we can see what is the best path to follow to achieve foreign direct investment to leverage reconstruction of a post-crisis country such as ours. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Thank you uh, very much. Now I would like to welcome to the rostrum the Prime Minister of Lesotho, Motoshe Thomas Tabane. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Moderator, Excellencies, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, allow me at the outset to express my appreciation to our gracious host, the UNCTAD Secretary General, Dr. Mukisa Kitui, for the invitation and excellent arrangements put at our disposal for me and my delegation. Lesotho is one of the countries which are open for business. As a landlocked country, investment is not an option, but a must for a sustainable economic growth. The private business activity, investment, and innovation are major drivers of productivity and job creation. We are therefore open for foreign direct investment, FDI, 
in major sectors of the economy. It is government policy that once established the principle of transparency and inclusiveness is afforded for foreign as well as national investors. We are therefore cognizant of the fact that the rule of law and good governance are a prerequisite for investment, as in investors require a safe environment where their investments will prosper and thrive. As such, we have moved a step further in reclaiming Lesotho as a land of peace and tranquility, which was the central pillar which our founding father, Kim Ushasha I, so much cherished and solidly founded his kingdom on. We are now embarking on comprehensive national reforms under the auspices of the Southern African Development Community, SADC, which will, among others, enhance our institutional and regulatory frameworks in order to bring stability for a conducive environment and investment to flourish. The government is also continuing to provide to, to, to prioritize the investment climate reform agenda to make it easy to do business in Lesotho through updating the legal and regulatory frameworks to provide for transparency, certainty, and predictability for business. Our one-stop business facilitation center in the Ministry of Trade and Industry has greatly reduced the number of procedures, length of time, and cost for investors to register and start businesses. Consequently, Lesotho has remarkably improved in overall position in the World Bank's uh, in, in inverted commas doing business rankings. We have also punched high on other indicators including inter alia, safeguarding investments, investor protection, and ease of trading across borders. Investment relies on industry to make it operational. The breadth and depth of the investment role in development depends on the efficiency of the industrial sector. Efforts should also be intensified to ensure that the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, and other relevant organizations support our work towards full implementation of Sustainable Development Goal Number 9 on building resilient infrastructure, promoting innovation, and sustainable infrastructure, more especially for the least developed countries like ours. The new industrialization based on digitalization, robotics, and big data could indeed immensely contribute to the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and vice versa. These technologies are today providing solutions to some of the world's hitherto biggest problems in various areas including health, education, energy, agriculture, disaster relief, among others. They are critical for the least developed countries to leapfrog perennial problems which have been tormenting their peoples. Like other countries, Lesotho has been building its digital network over the past years to improve network uh, connectivity, affordability, and accessibility. Despite a, dec a decade of high growth in the communication sector driven by mobile phone technology, broadband technology the connectivity remains a serious problem. This demonstrates that the least developed countries, including Lesotho, will still face colossal, col col colossal challenges to capture the opportunities resulting as a result of digitization. In this regard, if the premise of the UN 2030 agenda for leaving no one behind is to be realized, we have to address the existing digital divide, which threatens to translate into a development divide. With half of the world still offline and only one in six people among the LDCs currently using the internet, the international community to step up its support of these countries. We derive comfort that the share of ICT in total aid for trade has been steadily declining. Global digital solidarity should therefore be an overarching goal for the international community and all forms of cooperation, including the innovative financial resources, mobilization, transfer of sound technology, and capacity building should be explored. 
the international arrangements and measures, including the technology facilitation mechanism and the technology bank for the least developed countries as agreed in the Addis Ababa action agenda should be adequately supported. The international community should engage in deeper dialogue on how to effectively harness these technologies to make and to ensure prosperity for all and mitigate their possible risks. There are numerous concerns which are concomitant with digitization which merit special attention, including in Italia possible uh, uh, loss of jobs, and competitive behavior by first movers, data protection, cyber security, and tax erosion, as well as other ethical issues, including privacy and safety of these digital technologies. The long-standing challenges of least developed countries relating to a lack of supportive physical infrastructure and institutions such as road networks, access to electricity, postal services, should remain a top priority for the digital economy to grow. We call upon international organizations to continue with assistance to countries in strengthening their digital development strategies and adopting an, in, an enabling uh, environment. As I conclude, moderator, let me once again express our deepest appreciation for the continued support that UNCTAD and the Enhanced Integrated Framework EIF on rapid trade readiness assessment to Lesotho. This assessment will give us a full picture on the gaps which Lesotho has to fill in order to engage in trade uh, efficiency. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. And I'd now like to welcome to the Wastrom the President of the 73rd United Nations General Assembly, Ms. Maria Fernandea Espinosa Gothez. Thank you. Good morning. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Buenos dias. I will speak in my mother tongue, in Spanish. If you allow me, I, I say that in case you want to connect your translations ma machines. Uh, señores eh, jefes de Estado y de Gobierno, señor Secretario General eh, de la UNCTAD, Excelencias, eh, Damas y Caballeros, agradezco sinceramente la invitación para participar en este evento tan importante para todos los países del mundo, pero en particular aquellos países que tienen enormes desafíos para la implementación de la Agenda 2030 y los objetivos. 2030 de desarrollo agenda and the SDGs. Estamos aquí en Ginebra We are en un día muy especial. In Geneva, on este, a special el día day. de hoy es el Día de las Naciones This Unidas. Is the day las Naciones Unidas the cumplen United hoy Nations. 73 años the United de vida. Nations y qué mejor que hacerlo aquí en Ginebra, today. Eh, un lugar que se caracteriza por haber sido la casa del multilateralismo, la casa de la Liga de las Naciones, la Liga casa Nations, también de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas. Nuestra manera de celebrar es efectivamente construyendo This una organización cada día más relevante, cada día más eficiente, más cercana a la vida de la gente y al futuro de las personas. Es así como queremos celebrar este Día Internacional de las Naciones Unidas. Para la Asamblea General de la ONU, el principal foro para las deliberaciones multilaterales, los cambios tecnológicos abren una ventana de oportunidades para lograr eh, que eh, los compromisos plasmados en la Agenda 2030 para el desarrollo sostenible puedan ser abordados de la mejor manera. En esta agenda, los estados han reconocido que para lograr sus objetivos 
Ellas permiten movilizar it tecnología y recursos financieros y generar empleo decente. Estos son recursos críticos para los países en desarrollo, especialmente los menos adelantados. En particular, para lograr de aquí al año 2030 los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, se necesita entre 5 y 7 billones, billones de dólares de inversión anual en diversos sectores e industrias. Esta cifra no es menor, pero con el compromiso de todos podemos alcanzar sin duda Me gustaría señalar tres cuestiones en torno al tema que nos convoca el día de hoy. Primero, el sector privado juega un papel importante para lograr el empleo pleno y productivo y el trabajo decente para todas las personas de aquí al año 2030. Para alcanzar esta meta, se deberían crear 600 millones de nuevos puestos de trabajo que requerirán de inversiones de calidad y responsables. Para poder aprovechar esas oportunidades laborales emergentes, especialmente en los países en desarrollo, las personas deben estar preparadas en el uso y aprovechamiento de las nuevas tecnologías. El sector privado puede colaborar con los gobiernos para ello invirtiendo en educación, capacitación y desarrollo de capacidades en los ámbitos de la ciencia, la tecnología, las comunicaciones, la ingeniería y las matemáticas. La inversión en las pequeñas y medianas empresas son particularmente importantes, dado que representan entre el 60 y el 70% de las fuentes de trabajo alrededor del mundo. Un aspecto característico de esta nueva era de industrialización es la automatización de los trabajos, aspecto sumamente importante, ya que según estimaciones la automatización eliminaría 75 millones de empleos para el año 2022. No obstante, crearía 133 millones de nuevas oportunidades laborales. Es un en balance las nuevas tecnologías nos traen oportunidades que deben ser aprovechadas para que incluyan en lugar de excluir y amplíen en lugar de reducir nuestras expectativas del futuro del trabajo. En segundo lugar, las tecnologías bajas en carbono son fundamentales en nuestra lucha colectiva contra el cambio climático, en especial para limitar el calentamiento global a 1.5 grados Celsius. Creo que allí existe un enorme potencial para el sector público y privado y que debería ser aprovechado no solo por los réditos que podría conseguir en términos monetarios, sino porque es una inversión inteligente en un tema que nos afecta a todos por igual. El sector energético es un importante nicho de mercado. Alrededor del mundo, más de mil millones de personas aún no tienen acceso a energía eléctrica. Invertir en fuentes de energía limpia y accesible que permitan responder a esta demanda generará, sin duda, grandes beneficios económicos a quienes tengan la visión y el compromiso de hacerlo. En tercer lugar, las inversiones Thirdly, con un enfoque de género son claves para que las economías alcancen so su pleno potencial. A través de inversiones se pueden ampliar las oportunidades de empleo para there las mujeres y empoderarlas económicamente. Por ejemplo, conviene facilitar el emprendimiento de las mujeres en pequeñas y medianas empresas, pero también es necesario tener más mujeres en puestos de toma de decisión en el sector privado. Los números son sorprendentemente bajos. También con las nuevas tecnologías en el sector financiero que pueden constituir un cambio de paradigma en la inclusión financiera de las mujeres, en particular las mujeres rurales y las que viven en pobreza, quienes generalmente no tienen acceso a los servicios financieros tradicionales. En términos económicos, 
seguir perpetuando la desigualdad entre mujeres y hombres resulta sumamente costoso, pone obstáculos a la plena participación de las mujeres en las economías y limita el crecimiento de nuestros países. En promedio, las mujeres ganan 23% menos que los hombres y de las 500 empresas más grandes del mundo, menos del 5% presidentas ejecutivas ocupan esos cargos, lo que llamamos como CEOs. Menos del 5% de las grandes empresas están presididas por mujeres. Adicionalmente, los entornos laborales adversos que frenan el crecimiento profesional, el acoso sexual, los estereotipos de género y el acceso limitado a las tecnologías son solo algunos ejemplos de los obstáculos que en pleno siglo XXI aún enfrentan las mujeres en todos los países sin excepción. Los gobiernos, el sector privado y la sociedad en su conjunto deben reconocer estas realidades y corregirlas con un sentido de urgencia. Tenemos una extraordinaria oportunidad de hacer que la cuarta revolución industrial sea también la revolución de las mujeres. Para concluir, quiero mencionar que somos conscientes de que el rápido cambio tecnológico trae consigo enormes potenciales para resolver varios de los problemas más apremiantes del mundo, así también como grandes desafíos. Debemos trabajar hacia una visión común sobre el futuro de la humanidad, un futuro que nos sirva a todos, en el que nadie quede excluido. La nueva era de la industrialización debe ser un punto de inflexión para la humanidad para generar cambios positivos que transformen la vida de las generaciones presentes y conserven el futuro de las que vendrán. Muchas of today gracias. and leaves resources for that of the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would now like to invite the president of the Inter-Parliamentary Union, Ms. Gabriela Cuevas Baron, to um, address the audience in your chair. Secretary General, President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, I will follow the example of the President of the General Assembly and I will be speaking in Spanish too. La industrialización solía ser un proceso lento y complejo. Los cambios los podíamos ver cómo sucedían paulatinamente. Sin embargo, esto ya no sucede. Antes podíamos revisar cómo las inversiones se traducían en empresas, las empresas en empleos reality, y las posibilidades de trabajar de manera conjunta entre esas empresas y las comunidades together, eran fácilmente monitoreables y se podían ver los resultados de manera casi inmediata. That, Pero ahora los nuevos procesos de industrialización, industrialization la digitalización, la nanotecnología, la conectividad, Hacen que todos los procesos sean mucho más rápidos, más ágiles, difíciles incluso de monitorear porque todos los días sucede algo nuevo. Because there's something new patentes, every ideas, day, new productos, ideas, new products, bienes. new patents, services, goods. Y esto nos lleva a revisar this que las leads us to realize that the conditions for investment sí, need pero también con los entornos hand políticos, hand económicos, sociales. The economic processes, y estos, a su vez, de nueva cuenta, regresan a dar Thus, las condiciones propicias para nuevas ideas, right para nuevo emprendimiento. Hoy, sin duda, es fundamental entender and que el mundo se encuentra frente a un reto muy importante. Esta cuarta revolución industrial, como se le ha llamado, implica también nuevos procesos en distintas esferas. En primer lugar, se volverá indispensable First invertir all, más en educación, much more must en contar con mejores capacidades, con nuevas posibilidades de aprendizaje, que learning, sean más rápidas y que al mismo tiempo estén vinculadas al mercado laboral. También, de manera muy importante, Likewise, habrá que trabajar de igual manera 
to en países desarrollados work equally en países en in developed and developing countries. Hoy los países desarrollados, the developed aquellos que countries, son más grandes, which the larger ones now, una gran, eh, with un gran proceso de desarrollo, high levels of development, también países, aquellos que vemos como viejas economías, Contrast son los que van a sufrir de una manera mucho más They fuerte el impacto de los procesos de automatización. Pero por otro lado, los países en desarrollo, en donde apenas llega la tecnología, ways, tenemos primero dos opciones, o esperar a que lleguen las tecnologías, o ir de un solo paso a aquellas nuevas tecnologías que permiten cambiar de tajo la vida de la gente para llevar procesos de desarrollo. El reto más grande para los países en desarrollo estará en aquellos que se dedican a la manufactura, aquellos cuyos empleos dependen mucho más de la mano de obra que de los cambios tecnológicos que con su llegada sin duda pondrán en riesgo a esos empleos. Desde la Unión Interparlamentaria consideramos fundamental adaptarnos a estos nuevos tiempos y lograr que tanto desde el marco legislativo, que es el que regula en gran parte estas inversiones, como también desde el punto de vista de política pública, hay que recordar que la mayoría de los poderes legislativos del mundo son quienes hacen los presupuestos y el presupuesto si bien en muchos And casos pareciera eh, ser un proceso cases. aparte, en realidad es tan importante, es el principal so, instrumento de planeación, essential, el principal instrumento de política tool, pública con el que policy. cuenta un país. Es en el presupuesto donde realmente se ven reflejadas las prioridades de un Estado. Frente a estos nuevos procesos de industrialización, si realmente apostamos por un desarrollo mucho más igualitario, más incluyente, tenemos que hacer cambios importantes, no solo desde la esfera pública, también desde la esfera privada. Los nuevos modelos de inversión también deben adaptarse a estos nuevos tiempos. En construir economías que sean mucho más colaborativas que competitivas. Hoy la eficiencia en las cadenas de valor tiene que ver con ello, con la capacidad de encontrar a aquellos socios que nos permitan sí, ser más eficientes, pero también integrar eh, las distintas eh, etapas de las cadenas de valor. También de manera muy importante, es fundamental entender que los grandes flujos de inversión globales no solamente es importante tenerlos en la contabilidad macroeconómica, es fundamental que se conviertan en cambios en las comunidades donde tienen ese impacto. Hoy, el gran riesgo que enfrenta la globalización es la poca capacidad que tenemos para medir su impacto local. Y si realmente queremos alcanzar las metas que establece la Agenda 2030, esos cambios deben materializarse desde las comunidades porque solo así transformaremos al planeta. For us to también change the world. serán muy importantes los intercambios tecnológicos. There must be technological en muchos exchanges. países vemos Many que existe ya eh, una regulación que permite la colaboración, el intercambio de tecnología, que permite el aprendizaje, pero también for vemos otros casos donde, lessons por ejemplo, learned, los derechos de propiedad intelectual se traducen en una grave restricción de intercambio tecnológico. Insisto, es muy importante que avancemos hacia modelos really mucho más colaborativos que nos permitan alcanzar las metas de desarrollo de manera coordinada en lugar de esquemas competitivos. Eh, también se vuelve muy importante cambiar la mirada. Hemos estado durante mucho tiempo tratando de atraer capitales Inversiones que en gran parte se han enfocado al corto plazo. Capitales que apuestan mucho más por la especulación, por el dinero que hace dinero, y aquellas inversiones de largo plazo que generan los cambios que necesita hoy el planeta y que necesitan nuestros países. Hoy debemos apostar, sí, tal vez por esas inversiones que pudieran tener algo de riesgo, pero que a largo plazo risk, nos van a dar mucho mejores utilidades y sin duda, insisto, cambios de fondo, cambios en desarrollo. También, no solo Equally. le toca al sector privado, And le I'm toca al sector público hacer una tarea sector, muy importante. Sector, Hoy a nivel global debemos apostar por nuevos modelos que nos estén dando posibilidades de gobernanza. Si bien impulsados desde lo global, 
traducidos a resultados nacionales. And Hoy, más que nunca, los modelos Now, autoritarios y populistas ever, parecen cobrar sentido para algunas personas and, uh, porque la globalización parece que no les dejó ningún resultado. To, Hoy es momento en el que apostemos por modelos de gobernanza incluyentes basados en los cambios desde las comunidades y sin duda con la inclusión a aquellas comunidades que han estado marginadas del desarrollo y de la riqueza. También es importante que trabajemos tanto en lo público como en lo privado por nuevos modelos in the public educativos and private que vinculen mucho más for new el sector educativo, público y privado, con el mercado laboral y con las necesidades que tienen las nuevas industrias. And y por supuesto de ahí se desprende una nueva relación entre los sectores público y privado que debe obligar a un diálogo constante. Si bien este es un ejercicio an extraordinario y que ya llega a su décima edición, no debe ser la excepción. El diálogo entre todos los sectores es fundamental porque It únicamente tenemos 12 años para alcanzar las metas de desarrollo. Y si queremos cambiar a todo el planeta, necesitamos a todas las manos. Se vuelve we también muy importante que desde el sector público emprendamos the estrategias nacionales de empleo. Subsidios para aquellas empresas que están dispuestas a emplear a jóvenes y sin duda a mujeres. Emprender nuevos incentivos para los emprendedores y al autoemprendimiento. Hacer todos los incentivos necesarios para una correcta transición de economías informales a economías formales donde la gente pueda contar con seguridad social y sin duda propuestas importantes de salud y de seguridad social. Las economías verdes. Green economies, Por supuesto, parecen course, ser muy atractivas, pero tenemos que llevarlas a cabo. Los discursos no son suficientes y parece happen. que la economía It's verde va mucho más lenta them. que el, el combate que debemos dar al cambio climático. Desde la Unión Interparlamentaria, in hoy represento aquí las voces de los legisladores de prácticamente We todo el planeta. De 46 mil parlamentarios que estamos trabajando y que llevamos a cabo asambleas, resoluciones, pero también talleres muy importantes para saber hacer nuestra tarea de la manera más adecuada. Sabemos de la importancia de un marco regulatorio que fomenta la inversión. Sabemos también de la importancia para tener un marco impositivo y subsidios a acordes a los nuevos desafíos de las nuevas industrias. Estamos muy agradecidos desde la Unión Interparlamentaria por esta invitación y esperamos ser siempre parte de este diálogo tanto a nivel global como en cada uno de los parlamentos nacionales. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. I'd now like the uh, President of the World Economic Forum, Mr. Berger Brenda, to address the, uh, the summit, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you've got your microphone. F from the chair? You can sit there. Sit comfortably with your microphone. Yeah. So, um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, the invitation, but also uh, special thanks to the Secretary General and UNCTAD for taking this timely initiative uh, to really discuss uh, investments uh, in a time of globalization 4.0, or should we say um, how investments and trade is developing uh, in uh, industrial revolution, um, uh, fourth industrial revolution, um, context. And um, on top of these uh, paradigm changes when it comes to industrial production and technologies, we are also seeing geopolitical changes and geoeconomic changes uh, that um, are of um, great magnitude. We are faced with a truly multipolar world but also increasingly a multi-conceptual world. It's not that everyone believes in the same recipe. There are many recipes and systems um, out there. To navigate in this and also to find um, the right solution, sometimes it is also good to have some historic facts. 
Churchill said once that the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you're likely to see. I don't think you can find all the answers in history, but on some st st statistical numbers are quite telling. Let's not go back that far, but let's go back to 1990. Let's say that 1990 was an important um, point for um, trade, globalization, and foreign direct investments. So since 1990, the global GDP has doubled. Since 1990, the amount of people living in extreme poverty in the world has gone from 42% to 12%. In the same time, we added 2 billion people on our planet. Went from 5 billion to 7 billion. We added more people in 28 years than there were people living on our planet in the year 1900. And I see you, so many false thinkers here that, uh, you know, when you move from 40% or 42% in extreme poverty to close to 10% in 28 years, and you added uh, 2 billion on top of it, these numbers are even more staggering. And the basis for this exceptional poverty eradication and development was that trade was a driver for growth foreign direct investments that we have not seen at that level any time in our history was a driver of growth. Growth was of, of trade and FDIs were higher than the growth overall uh, in the global, uh, global GDP. So, hence I think it is a bad idea to stop globalization, but I think we should improve it. We have to make sure that globalization is more equitable and fair, job-creating, sustainable, and um, also that it fights inequalities. Hence, I also think we have to upgrade trade, not stop trade. Hence, I think we have to upgrade foreign direct investments and what they mean and the impact, not stop it. We are currently seeing uh, quite substantial global economic growth still, moving from 3.9 maybe to uh, 3.7 this year. And um, we are seeing increasing increasingly we are seeing worries in the markets. I think part of this is that markets are also worried because there is not a lot of gunpowder yet if we are faced with a global slowdown in the economy. If we were to see a new recession in a year, what kind of fiscal gunpowder did we have? What kind of monetary gunpowder do you have? In Japan, there is uh, zero um, interest rate. Europe is very low. So to secure growth in the coming years are very important, so we are in a better space to also face the slowing down of the growth that inevitably will be there. We are also seeing worries because of this notion of trade wars. I would say that trade is not a weapon. Trade is peace. And trade done in the right way can also create new connections and also mitigate tensions between nations. Look at Europe. The two world wars that we have seen happen in this continent. And the way we tried to build a different Europe was to also create the coal and steel union and later on the European Union, making sure that we started to trade with each other. And if we um, mainly you don't go to war with your uh, main trading partner. World Economic Forum is the international organization for public-private cooperation. That means that we have some of the most impactful companies in the world as our partners, but we're also multi-stakeholder, multi bringing in governments, but also civil society. And we have lately seen that there are concerns among uh, our partners and members uh, that there are barriers to investment, direct or indirect. So, 
we also have seen this on, on trade. We saw that at MC10, the trade minister meeting. Uh, so we have been engaged the World Economic Forum very much in trade facilitation, how to make trade easier also among developing countries. But we also have to do more in trade, uh, in facilitation of investments. But this are, these are tricky topics. We have to get a right balance of obligations between foreign investors and host states. And we have to broaden the purpose broaden the purpose. If you want to stay in a country for a long time, you cannot only look at the quarterly results. You also have to look at the footprint you're leaving. You have to look at also how you contribute to society at large, the country at large. These are the investors countries are looking for. And we have to enable more sustainable development. So I think one idea that we should discuss here today is also an um, international support program for sustainable investments. When I was foreign minister in my own country, in Norway, we launched a huge package when it came to how to facilitate trade better, more uh, fair trade. But I think we also should do something here when it comes to investments. And as I said, all this is happening at the same time as we're seeing a paradigm shift when it comes to technologies. And as the Secretary General also was mentioning uh, in his um, introductionary remarks, the fourth industrial revolution is also a huge opportunity to leapfrog. You know, you don't need anymore to build landlines when you got the mobiles. Um, financial services is a prerequisite. The banking system is a prerequisite for getting out and the financial market is a prerequisite for getting out of poverty. And uh, now you have blockchain that is also a huge opportunity. But let's face it, technology can also increase differences because uh, sometimes the winner takes it all. So we have to make sure that technology is an enabler for leapfrogging and also give opportunities to developing countries. That's why I was, Madam Moderator, one and a half a week ago, I was in um, New Delhi together with Prime Minister Modi. We opened the World Economic Forum's fourth industrial center in India, looking at how we can also make sure that the largest democracy in the world, 1.3 billion people, will capitalize in a positive way on the fourth industrial revolution. And things are changing very fast. I was also on a panel with the Alibaba uh, head the other day, and every day Alibaba is um, 120 million packages every day by Alibaba, not mentioning mm -hmm. Amazon. The reality is that the digitalization also removes physical flow of goods. But let's make sure that these removals of barriers also will work in favor of what is really at stake is that we meet the sustainable development goals that many of the distinguished uh, head of states and also panelists were mentioning uh, here already. Sustainable development goals, 17 goals, but the main goal is still that by 2030, we should be able to eradicate all extreme poverty on our planet. Thank you. Thank you very much. And what a fantastic fact there that the Chinese internet giant Alibaba delivers 120 million packages a day. Thank you very much. I shall be using that fact in the future. I would now like to invite uh, the chief executive of the diamond, uh, diamond giant De Beers, Bruce Cleaver, to address the assembly. And you've got your microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Secretary General, Your Excellencies, Honourable Ministers, distinguished guests. I'm going to try and address very briefly some ways where we at De Beers are trying to sketch out scenarios for new industrialization supporting the SDGs. I'm going to talk principally about SG, SDGs 5 and 13, but all underpinned by SDG 17, which is partnerships, because for me that is the key to delivering them in the future. It's certainly unclear to me, and unclear to, I think to everybody, what the specific impacts of new industrialization will be on the nature of work, trade, investments, development, and frankly, even relationships. What we do know is there will be changes, and the changes will be in all businesses, not just in the mining world that I come from, but across all industries globally. Due to the scale and range of these impacts, I don't think one actor or sector will be able to address the challenges of the new industrialization in isolation. 
And I think each actor should consider their own responses as part of a much wider ecosystem. History, of course, tells us that overall technological innovation has resulted in positive human development. But we're conscious, of course, that the benefits that this overall improvement will bring will not be shared equally with countries, communities, and individuals all being affected in different ways. Some national economies may no doubt face significant challenges, but each country and each company will face different ones and will need to solve them together. I'm going to share two programs that De Beers is committed to, which I think illustrate some of the best possible scenarios for the new industrialization to support the SDGs by highlighting at all times the importance of partnerships. I think the private sector has a very key role to play in the delivery of the SDGs. Of course, the ongoing success of business will depend on our accountability for our contributions to our communities and to sustainable development generally. And for us, the SDGs provide a particularly valuable lens for business to translate development priorities into action. I lead an organization which employs over 20,000 men and women around the world on a global scale with very diverse operations. We have made good progress on our journey to put our businesses on a more sustainable long-term footing, but there is much, much more for us to do. And it's clear to me that as we look to 2030, incremental steps will not be enough. To achieve the scale of transformation required to address the economic, social, and environmental challenges which have all been spoken about today, we're all going to have to go well beyond business as usual. The most powerful and impactful actions we as a group can take in support of the SGDs are through our core operations and by harnessing the collective resources of our entire value chain, exploration to retail. We also have a contribution to make as a leader of an industry that I think can be realized, but only through partnerships. Now, we have great partners around the world across our value chain. I'm very privileged today to share a platform with President Masisi, and the Botswana government has been De Beers' most significant and valued partner over more than 50 years. And together we are walking the path in meeting the SDGs and sharing our successes and learnings along the way. Access to, and importantly, the ability to understand and to use technology can have a very positive impact on individuals' freedom of expression, education, choice, and employment. But research shows that women, particularly in developing countries, face very significant barriers to technology access and adoption, which in turn makes them less likely to benefit from the advancements in technology and investments as compared with men. As a business with operations primarily in emerging markets, we have a responsibility to play in meeting SDG 5, achieving gender equality and empowerment for girls, working closely with our partner country governments and other actors. We have a very large and significant diversity journey that we have started on working with our communities and our partner governments. Just a few examples. Last year, we entered a three-year partnership with UN Women. As part of that partnership, we undertook to invest over and above all of the other monies we invest in social development, $3 million in our partner countries, Canada, Namibia, Botswana, and South Africa. We did a needs assessment for these locations and split the investments into two different ways. STEM education promotion in Canada and entrepreneurs being helped, female micro-entrepreneurs being helped to develop in our southern African countries, Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa. We've worked with UN Women to extend STEM scholarship programs in the universities in Calgary and Waterloo in Canada to encourage more women into technical aspects to equip them with the skills required in the future. These programs have a very particular focus on supporting women from indigenous communities in the Northwest Territories and in Northern Ontario, where we have operations. Um, by the time the end of the program, we will have offered at least 30 scholarships to women from these remote and indigenous communities. And we're also investing significantly in trying to encourage children, females of a school-going age, to be more interested in STEM subjects. So we host a number of STEM workshops for 13 and 14 year olds throughout their summer holidays. We've developed and designed a three year program to support women micro entrepreneurs in South Africa. These programs have been launched in Namibia, Botswana and South Africa, always in partnership with local stakeholders and governments. And the key objective of these is to equip women micro entrepreneurs with business management and with life skills to build their confidence and a capacity to operate and grow successful small businesses. Over the three-year program, we will support more than 1,200 women entrepreneurs across these three countries. 
We are also working in partnership towards SDG 13 climate action by looking very hard at the future of carbon neutral diamond mining at some of our operations in the next five to 10 years. Our scientists are working in very close collaboration with a team of internationally renowned independent scientists to investigate the potential to store very large volumes of carbon at our diamond mines through mineralization of kimberlite tailings. This is the material that's left after diamonds have been recovered. This project will accelerate what is already a naturally occurring and very safe process of kimberlite naturally extracting carbon from the atmosphere and storing it. And we hope to do that at a speed that will offset man-made carbon emissions. Can you imagine a future world of mining without carbon? Diamonds, of course, hold a unique place in marking life's most precious moments. And the lives of millions of our consumers around the world, they support economies of host countries and the livelihoods of millions of people across our value chain. At De Beers, we believe that it is our responsibility but also our privilege to be working with our partners in contributing towards the delivery of the SDGs. We have made great progress, which we celebrate, but we have a long way in partnership to go. Thank you very much. Oh, and finally, I'd like to ask our last speaker of the panel, the Chief Executive of Ethiopian Airlines, Tewolde Gebra Mariam, to speak to address, if you'd like to, with your microphone. It's working. Madam Moderator, Thank you. Excellencies, Heads of States, and Excellency, the Secretary General of uh, ANCTAD, uh, distinguished guests, it's a truly a pleasure and an honor to be with you this morning and to be part of this important conference. Uh, let me thank the ANCTAD uh, Secretary and his team for giving me the opportunity to be here and for organizing such important conference. Let me first introduce uh, Ethiopian Airlines, uh, not to my fellow Africans, but uh, for uh, uh, clarity, Ethiopian Airlines is a Pan-African, uh, the largest airline in the continent of Africa operating about 110 modern and young fleet, flying to more than 116 international destinations in five continents and 22 destinations in Ethiopia, employing more than 16,000 employees, serving the continent for the last 72 years, uh, bringing Africa closer and together and closer to the world. Uh, I think Ethiopian Airlines can serve as an example and a case study for the conference that we are discussing today. Number one, Ethiopian Airlines is fully 100% government owned by the government of Ethiopia. Number two, Ethiopian Airlines has been serving the continent of Africa for the last 72 years and it is the largest uh, airline, although the Ethiopian economy is not the largest in, 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 in Africa. So if we talk about government ownership being a problem for success, I don't think Ethiopian, uh, I don't think that is true because Ethiopian airlines defies that uh, belief. If we think that African companies cannot compete in the global stage, again, that is not true because Ethiopian Airlines is competing in the global stage, succeeding with the mega carriers of this world. Ethiopian Airlines is providing much needed and critically essential air connectivity to Africa and connecting the continent with its major trading partners in Asia, right from Tokyo, Seoul, China, India, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Europe, North America, and South America. Trade and investment require air connectivity. Air connectivity is essential. All of us here have come to this conference by air. Most at least, if not uh, from Europe, continental Europe. 
those of us who have uh, crossed continents must have come by air, for sure. There is no other means or alternative means of transport. So connectivity is very important, and particularly important for African countries at this uh, level of uh, their development. Uh, what Ethiopian Alliance is doing in the continent can also be an example for the discussion here. Ethiopian Airlines is investing in other African countries to improve air connectivity within Africa. Connectivity within Africa has improved tremendously, but still it is a challenge. Uh, in some parts of Africa, we have eliminated the problem of flying to Europe to connect with your neighbor country. But in, in some parts of Africa, we are still seeing that challenge. So uh, we have formed an aviation hub in Togo, serving West and Central Africa. After the demise of Air Africa, Nigeria Airways, Ghana Airways, and the others, that region has been completely without any air service for many years. Now, with an airline called Askai based in Togo, uh, the region is well connected, has been well connected since 2010 for the last eight years, serving 22 destinations in both Central and Western Africa. We are also forming another hub in Malawi, uh, another hub in Mozambique, and another hub in Zambia and Chad, and also in Guinea. This shows the partnership that is going on between Ethiopian Airlines and these countries. These countries will be connected to the main hub and to the 116 destinations all over the world. So this is going to improve connectivity in Africa, and connectivity in Africa is going to improve inter-Africa trade. This is a big challenge for Africa today. Africa is trading with itself only 15% or 16%. The rest of the trade is north and east. So when we compare that figure with Europe, it is 60%, 6 zero. Europe trades 60% of its trade with its, within itself, but 15% for Africa. That is a huge challenge. And trade always follows comparative advent, advantages of nations. Africa is a huge continent. And our comparative ad advantages of each nation varies. And therefore, that calls for trade within the continent. Ethiopia exports flour to Europe. But some, Africa, some West African countries import the same flour from Europe. This is a predicament that we are facing today in Africa. And African governments and the African Union and the UN uh, UNCTAD and other UN agencies have to support African uh, countries to resolve this problem. Uh, on the other hand, uh, investment follows trade, and trade follows investment. And investment is flow of capital. Now, flow of capital is improving with the fourth industrial revolution or the digital economy. But investment flow depends on the right policy framework of the country. So we should not be waiting for investment to come, but we should go and grab investment by providing the right policy framework, but at the same time the right regulatory framework, which, which encourages investment. Uh, Coming back to the industrial revolution, Ethiopian Airlines can also be an example here. It is a completely digital airline and paperless, completely paperless airline in the continent of Africa. Uh, digital revolution makes business easy, convenient, efficient, and boosts productivity, makes distance and location irrelevant. Uh, but it has also the downside. So we have to manage the downsides. Uh, we'll, not, we'll change not only the way we work, also the way we live. 
The big question is readiness and preparedness. The downside, the consequences like job losses, at Ethiopian Airlines, we are careful not to affect creation of jobs by technology. We are 100 plus million population country. So job creation is very important. And robotics, artificial intelligence, and other forms of technology are going to displace people from their jobs. We need to be careful. Privacy, evasion of privacy is another important downside of technology. Technology and in, 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 uh, digital technology falling in their wrong hands, in the hands of criminals, is all, also another major challenge. It's also killing human skill, manual skill. Pilots are today trained in the latest technology, airplanes. While that has facilitated flying, makes flying, made flying uh, easier, convenient, more comfortable, and more efficient, but it is also destroying the human skill of flying. So backup systems are very important. Network failures and cyber attacks can cause havoc in society, as we have seen them. And social medias are destabilizing societies. So as long as we, we are prepared with the right policy framework and regulatory framework, industrial revolution or the fourth industrial revolution is going to help us boost productivity uh, increase output and reduce poverty in as much as the, the previous three industrial revolutions have done. The three industrial revolutions have upgraded the world and have shrunk the world to smaller and smaller and now the world has become a small village but unfortunately they have also left their uh, negative consequences as uh, sometimes it, take, it becomes the winner takes all situation and it leaves some section of society or some geography underprivileged and therefore with huge inequality of incomes among people and inequality of incomes among countries. And that creates uh, destabilization and disturbs the harmonious coexistence of human beings in the world. Uh, but investments have to be also in a cluster forms where input output relationships can enhance the growth in a faster and more efficient manner. Uh, import substitution and export promotion should be well aligned. So these are some of the um, uh, points that we are learning today in the fourth industrial revolution. Ethiopian Airlines uniquely and most uniquely than, uh, exceptionally than from the rest of the uh, airlines in the world have, uh, has huge uh, infrastructure uh, facilities. We have the largest aviation academy in Africa because we believe that in order for Africa to take advantage of the 21st century uh, trade, investment, and tourism grows, we have to educate our people. Education is the greatest equalization of human beings. So education is very important. Uh, we have to prepare our people for investment, for foreign direct investment, to take advantage of that foreign direct investment. Otherwise, if people are not prepared, if people are not educated, then they will be uh, by, uh, bystanders in their own economic development. Uh, we have uh, full MRO capabilities right from the beginning with the principle of self-sufficiency. So that enabled us to take advantage of absorbing new technology when new airplanes came like the 787. As you may know, Ethiopia, because of Ethiopian Airlines, Ethiopia was the second country in the world to take a delivery of the 787 Dreamliner next to Japan. But since we were prepared, 
we were able to operate that uh, highly technologically advanced uh, airplane uh, and maintain it and operate it with our own people. So capital and technology absorption is also very important. So uh, once again, I thank the organizing, uh, the organizing team of the conference and all of you, thank you very much. Thank you uh, to all our panel of speakers. You can now have a rest. You can sit down. We don't need you to go to the rostrum anymore. I believe you have a microphone next to you for your uh, question and answer, answer session. So we'll now be having a, a bit of a debate, a few questions um, coming out of some of those speeches. So let's start with the uh, president of Armenia, Mr. Sarkissian. Well, was I right, Mr. Sarkissian, in saying that you had a particle accelerator in Armenia? That's true. That's it. I don't think many people would have, would have thought that, would they? And you talked about this unknown Armenia and that the, the, you've entered into the digital economy and the importance of education. Could you t sort of elaborate on that a little further, please? Some of the things that have happened in your country. Well, uh, I will try to do that shortly. I do agree that uh, I do agree with the president of the World Economic Forum that Globalization has done tremendous good to, to the world, and it, uh, the world has been driven with the ideas of globalization, but the locomotives of the globalization, early 90s and today, the locomotives are changing. Let me bring you a, a simple example. If you take the best universities in the world, be that Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, or in Seattle and others, and you ask the graduates of that university where they would like to work after graduation, and early 90s, everybody probably will say out of 20, 19 or 20 would say they would like to become investment bankers. You ask them today what they would like to do after graduation of these great universities, a, part, a big part of them would like to go and work for venture funds, the others to have their own startups. The third one will be inspired with the ideas of sustainable economy and preservation of, of, the, of the world. So the world is changing, and globalization in some sense is becoming also, in, if we use the right word here in the right, with the right meaning, is becoming more liberalized. So it's a globalization which is going through liberalization where you are engaging more and more people, you are making it more natural, you are making more engaging the, those who were not engaged at all before. So the world is changing. So that means also educational systems are changing. You take any child in the world, anywhere, I think before even going to school or learning how to write, they're using the computer, they're using an iPad, iPhone, or whatever you like. I think the whole system of education is changing. And Armenia has got this probably quite early. And parallel to the classical educational system, the schools that we have, of course the schools, like in every country, you can have top private schools which are basically leading with the wonderful ideas. They are very, very interesting schools, but also the target should be to have a homogeneous good education for everyone. But parallel to that, there is a, another tendency to get a, an education not only in school, where you can teach many things. For example, in Armenia, we teach chess from class one in every school. So that's another way of changing the world. You are teaching children from early age logic but also computers. And the way to the, the teach the computer is not only in a simple classroom. The example that I brought is, is this network, which is, there are several ones, and this one, which is the most successful, is called TUMO. What is TUMO at the end of the day? After school, any child can enter that center, get four hours free education, fantastic computer, the one of the best of Macs, and get four hours of free education under supervision of a very talented teacher. So every day, four hours after the school, not on the street, not here, not there, in that place, learning. And the teachers are looking at the talent. So there are some that have musical talent. They are the future DJs, because the world is changing. The most famous guys in, for 20 years old, boys and girls, they are not the famous composers, they are the famous DJs of this world. Those who have uh, qualities in design, they are getting into design groups and further. And then the next floor of that institution, which are, is much bigger than this whole, 
are uh, places for startups. So you go there for three or four years, you get getting educated. So the classical education, in order to be a good programmer, not necessarily you have to go to ordinary school, you can become a driver, and that's uh, of a new startup, the new world with the new startups. So you would agree with the uh, chief executive of uh, Ethiopian Airlines that education is the greatest equalizer? It's not only greater equalizer, but it's also the greatest locomotive. You look at the new generation. This summer, I went to a startup summit in Armenia. There was 1,200 startups from the region. 1,200 from 16 to 25 years old boys and girls that believe that they can be successful. And the other thing you mentioned, which I thought was quite extraordinary, is that there's four to five times the amount of Armenians living abroad than living in your country. Is that a strength for bringing in investment, bringing in contacts, people living throughout the world that have an allegiance to your country? Well, definitely that's a strength. At the end of the day, it's a connectivity. And because of the fourth industrial uh, revolution, or whatever you call it, at the end of the day, they are just very strong uh, participants of our, of, of, our, uh, of our country. Because they are monitoring whatever is happening in Armenia daily, hourly. They are expressing their it's not just uh, a show that you watch about your country every day. Like on the, it's an interactive one. You express your ideas, you express your uh, your uh, thoughts and basic beliefs and not beliefs. So, having a small country and a global nation, which in many countries, well, I don't want to bring examples. There are huge examples of successful people. So they are engaging more and more with the country. Well, and Armenia many in is not Greece unique. Greece or Ireland. There's many examples yeah, of the yeah. big diaspora. Armenia is not unique. It's just a small example of possible great successes in the future. And education matters. Education matters. Right, the president of Botswana, Mr. Uh, Masisi, uh, we, we discussed the role that foreign investment can play in industrial development. So how is uh, foreign direct investment contributing to the industrial development in your country, in Botswana, and in, more importantly, the diversification beyond mining? Well, I've got to acknowledge that uh, foreign direct investment in the mining sector has been the largest we've realized. And take note that in the year 2010, 2011, we actually had a spike. We had a 1.4 billion US dollars foreign direct investment, largely due to the translocation of the diamond marketing and sales from London um, to Khabarori. But over and above that, we've had diversification um, in the areas of agriculture, uh, tourism um, and um, manufacturing, uh, albeit small, it has gone to other sectors beyond mining. And a lot of this is really due to um, the climate that we've offered and projected uh, so positively, uh, an enabling environment, um, uh, an ambient legislative uh, framework and the governance that we offer um, no uh, limits to um, remittances of your foreign capital and profits. And uh, this has built confidence in many, many investors. We also have uh, promulgated policies to promote diversification. Um, a number of them are like, brought. Yeah. Well, we have, uh, we have uh, the industrial development policy um, that uh, we, we've put in place. Um, we've got uh, what's called the EDD, um, Economic Diversification Drive, um, and a cluster development uh, uh, program that we've put in place, uh, and a whole host of others that we continuously review uh, to make right. Um, and more recently, we've got uh, a program um, uh, incentive scheme in a particular, particularly depressed part of the country where we had the largest copper nickel mine closed, shut down. Um, because of lack of profitability, um, where we offer in the first five years a tax rate of 5% um, and then 10% for the next uh, 10 years. Uh, we also discussed the implications for new industrial trends, uh, for the opportunities developing company, countries have to build up productive capacity. How do you see these trends impact on the development path of Botswana and on the approach that the country should take to strategically promote investment? Well, you know, we, we have sought to 
develop responses that are most appropriate to our circumstance. Uh, and our circumstance happens to be um, that we are a landlocked country in the middle of southern Africa, semi-arid, etc., and uh, sitting right next to a very powerful economy, South Africa, but have historically been severely underdeveloped. So we've uh, taken a lot of the remittances or the profits, the revenue, from our most profitable sector, diamond mining, and invested that in education, social development, roads, health services, and infrastructure development. And infrastructure development here also in, includes the ICT sector uh, and the modernization of our economy and improvement of linkages to the rest of the world is critical. And so as we venture out, um, we would want to attract investment, which investment would be made comfortable by the trends that are occurring um, uh, globally. And so uh, not only are we investing in the mining as we know it, but the knowledge capital to do the mining, the finance um, uh, management of that, including um, you know, the, 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 the innovations that are required to mobilize the so many youth, young persons who are coming out of schools who would very badly need, need a job. I think we're, we're definitely getting a sense from the panel that education is important, transport's important, and logistics of a country are important as well. Um, Chief Executive De, of De Beers, Mr. Cleaver, um, you've heard what President Botswana has had to say about his country's industrial policy. Of course, De Beers, an important investor in Botswana. Um, could you comment on what, what was said? You know, in the time that we've been in partnership with the Botswanan government, which is more than 50 years, um, and it's often said that it's the most successful public-private partnership of all time. I'm not sure how you measure that, but it shows you how long it's been around. I think it has been characterized by all the things President Masisi speaks about, because uh, if you think about the mining business, you make long-term capital investments, and it takes you a long time to have your uh, return come back to you because you don't get an instant return. If you build a mine, sometimes it can take you five to seven years to build a mine. You sink all this capital in up front, and you need to wait to get the return. And you could never do that in a place where the environment wasn't stable enough and the regulatory regime wasn't clear. I mean, what foreign investors really want is clear, simple regulatory regime. Although, of course, if it was unstable, you would require a, a greater return, greater profits. Yes, as you're a foreign for, investor, for you sit risk. and decide where to allocate your capital, and you go to places, as a rule, where the regime, uh, the, the regulatory regime, the fiscal regime is more stable, there's less risk, therefore you might be prepared to allocate more capital in that part of the world. And I think the Botswana government has been an absolute model of how a foreign investor should be treated, because the kind of basic framework for investing as a foreigner has been in place since the beginning and remains in place. So I think it's a good illustration of what you can do to try and encourage people to, to, to invest. Clearly there are, as you heard President Masisi say in his formal address, there are different issues going forward. But uh, I think for me the fundamental for any business is stability of the regulatory and the fiscal regime, good governance. Uh, you know, with those two you can make places. And work. again, we've heard a lot about the importance of good governance and the rule of law from most of the panel. You operate in 18, 20 countries? 20. So, so you have a very different perspective of industrial policy and investment in those countries. Um, where, uh, sort of what things do you want to see done well and what things maybe put you off investing? So give us a little list, if you're a country, what you need to do to attract uh, foreign direct investment? So, so where I sit, I think there are four prerequisites we always look for, and obviously the opposite of these is what you don't look for. The first one, for sure, is governance. Uh, countries that respect the rule of law and countries where your security of tenure is without question are absolutely the places you're going to start to look at as a foreign investor. And as I say, it may be different in other industries, but in mining, you make long-term investments with long-term returns. You need, these, you need the visibility of this over a long road. Uh, the second one, as I touched on earlier, is the question of stability. I think it's very important that the regulatory regime, the fiscal regime, remains broadly the same. Now, we all live in a volatile world, mining all industries, all governments, and the world is changing faster than ever, and we recognize countries change. But the, some kind of basic framework that is in place throughout your investment is important. There are countries that 
for example, radically change the tax rate, and I understand why they do that, but it does make a long-term investment more complicated. I think the third thing we look for is simplicity. There's nothing that kills investment faster than bureaucracy. And so we look around the and world... We've heard that elsewhere, actually, about the red tape. Red tape, and I think even more in the modern world where communication is instant and social media is instant. We're not saying that businesses shouldn't be regulated, not at all, and there's no cowboy approach here, but we do need a balance between swifter regulation and bureaucracy. So some places you go to, you can take seven to ten years to get a permit. Now, it can't be that all the regulation takes you that long to work through. Time is money, obviously, so we look for places where the bureaucracy is not large and it's simpler to do business. And I think the last one um, that we look at is, you know, do, do the countries in which we invest invest in their countries? Because we can only do so much. So countries that invest in education, we've heard so much about that already, uh, in healthcare, in particularly in Southern Africa, where that's a major issue, as you would expect. Those are other places that we would find attractive. And underpinning all of that is this theme I spoke about earlier, which is the question of partnership. Now, that's not possible for every business with every government, but if you're a substantial enough business, it is important that you can sit together as adults and sort out your differences, because you don't always have the same aspirations as a government or a private sector partner. So I think if you can marry all of those, it makes it a substantially easier place for a foreign investor to invest. Dr. Oh, thank you. Uh, moderator, if I may just try to recast some of this discussion in line with... Uh, connected with what we're doing yesterday. One of the outcomes of our discussions about globalization and the headwinds it's facing today was that deregulation allowed exponential growth of wealth, but also exponential growth of inequality. And to future-proof the fourth industrial revolution, we have to address how can we build in mechanisms to reduce differentiation from the gains of the new technologies. I'm a commissioner with the Broadband Commission, and this year we celebrated that for the first time, 50% of humanity is digitally included, broadband, they have access to internet. Although not, again we heard from the panel, not in, in, in lesser developed countries. But I said 50% of humanity. Our challenge is the other 50%. What is it we need to do collectively to digitally include the other 50%? Three key questions come to mind for us. The first one is why is it that the world is so much saying digital revolution is important, and yet if you look at the content of ODA, which is important to LDCs, if you look at the content of the development bank financing, including the World Bank, only 1% of World Bank financing goes to the ICT sector. And of that 1%, only 4% goes to policy development and ICT-related services. So that is a challenge that political leadership has to address. How do we mobilize the resourcing of digital infrastructure for the half of the human population that is left out? There's a second problem. The new revolution spurs a need for constant re reorganization of curricula. How do we align national education policies with content development skills, particularly in the developing countries? Number three, e-commerce e has grown consistently above global GDP over the past 10 years. Jack Ma said at the General Assembly this year, nine, no, at WTO Public Forum last month, that in the next 15 years, 90% of global trade is going to be electronic commerce, which means if you are not visible in a digital marketplace, you are not in a marketplace. How do we scramble digital market visibility for countries with political analog thinking? And this debate requires that more than ever before, younger entrepreneurs in all countries have to be at the table because they are much, much more aware of the, the requirements of digital inclusion, the requirements of an ecosystem to unlock their potential. I think, I think the Prime Minister of Lesotho said it was global digital solidarity, which I thought was a great expression. Um, and uh, President Botswana was then talking about developing countries not yet having adequate ICT infrastructure. So again, very much a theme from the panel. Um, the, um, Professor Tuadera from the President of the Central African Republic. Um, you are listening to me in French, good. Um, 
You mentioned the low levels of foreign direct investment that the Central African Republic has received. I think you said just $17 million last year. What are you trying to do, other than coming to this conference, what are you trying to do to overcome this shortfall and increase the attractiveness of your economy to foreign investors? Thank you. Yes, when I spoke earlier, I did say the low level of foreign direct investment in the economy of the Central African Republic. I was just listening to the CEO of Ethiopian Airlines, and he was saying we mustn't wait for investment to come. First, we must create the conditions to attract investment, and I was also listening to the director of De Beers. Of course, the government hasn't remained idle. Several measures have been taken, and they are ongoing, in order to attract foreign direct investment. For instance, there are four measures, which are the main measures. For instance, we have single stop windows for formalities for enterprises. The director of De Beers mentioned that. We have to create good conditions for creating enterprises. We have to make the administrative work less burdensome, and we've tried to do that. We have the single stop window in a single place. Here you can find all the state services necessary to create an enterprise. So in 48 hours, you can set up a company in Central African Republic. Secondly, we have the investment charter now, which we have created. This is for tax and customs advantages to all investors investing in a certain number of fields for all persons investing in the Central African Republic. We've created a law. It's a law on a code of commerce to make the sector clearly regulated and attractive. And now we have the International Trade Center and our National Investment Commission working together to create an investment agency for exports, uh, investment and export agency. I think everyone has been speaking about this, creating favorable conditions to enable foreign investors and enterprises to come in to invest in the Central African Republic. We've also been working in the legal sector. Now we are working within our legal system to provide legal security for investment. I think all of these measures together are creating good conditions for investors to come and work in the Central African Republic. Um, we heard from the chief executive of Ethiopian Airlines about regional development and the fact that uh, within Africa, only 16% intra-trade, but within Europe, for example, 60% intra-trade. So regional integration expected to boost foreign direct investment in Africa. What, is, what are you doing? What's your engagement in the regional and pan-African context? The Central African Republic is a party in several zones of economic integration, economic and monetary community of uh, Central Africa, the community of states of Central Africa as well. These are communities to expand the market with customs regulations for the entire area. And now Africa has a new pro program of free trade zones. And this expands and extends the African market. So if you invest in one country, then that investor knows he has a larger market available. If you invest in the Central African Republic, then you can 
reach the whole of the Central African Economic and Monetary Community yes. at the same time. Thank you, merci. Um, Chief Executive of Ethiopian Airlines, Mr. Gabri Mariam, you, we've heard for a number of members of the panel about this idea of leapfrogging. So the classic example is if you're a lesser developed country, you don't have to build out uh, an old-fashioned fixed-line telephony network. You can jump straight towards mobile phone network. And there's two things I thought were quite interesting you said. One, you have a paperless airline. What do you mean by that? How have you achieved it? And second, that you were the, the second buyer of the 787 Dreamliner. So just explain how that sort of works with this idea of leapfrogging, the advantage maybe in being uh, from a lesser developed country. Yeah, with your microphone. Uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, uh, we, we have now better and more opportunity to leapfrog even the developed world uh, because in some uh, sectors like ICT uh, or information and communication technology, um, uh, the first mover adv advantage is somehow fading away. In fact, the late mover advantage is coming when the rest of the world, especially the developed world, is struggling with credit cards uh, as forms of payment, US and Europe, uh, new innovations, uh, mobile payment and mobile banking and uh, uh, mobile money is taking uh, advantage of uh, ICT in Africa today. M-Pesa is a global leader today in mobile uh, banking. We are making use of uh, that facility as an airline in Africa. So I think uh, with um, technology proliferating now uh, in most of part of our world and the cost of that technology is getting cheaper and cheaper, uh, least developed countries and, uh, or developing countries have the advantage of taking uh, this uh, new technology available, accessibility, accessible, and also at least cost, uh, they can leapfrog the, 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 the uh, developed world. For instance, as you mentioned, uh, today in our world, the most technologically advanced airplanes in the 21st century uh, are two. One from the Boeing family, the 787 Dreamliner, and the second from the uh, Airbus family, the Airbus A350. And look at now Ethiopia, a uh, developing country, but taking advantage of these two advan technologically advanced airplanes. And sort of lower fuel, exactly, more efficient, with all lower the cost. efficiency, and with all the uh, competitive advantage. But how did we do it? One, number one, we have uh, a planning horizon, a planning policy of long term. I think. Uh, someone mentioned uh, in the panel here, we, it is very dangerous to manage businesses, global businesses, from quarter to quarter. But unfortunately, the stock exchange drives that short-term uh, uh, mindset. Uh, we have Vision 2025 at Ethiopian Airlines for 15-year strategic roadmap for the airline, which started in 2010. So now when you visit most airlines in the world today, they're Maybe they have an annual plan, or at best they have five years plan. Uh, but long-term thinking and long-term uh, planning is very important. And I think um, w the countries in Africa have to also learn from this because development, economic development takes a long time. Uh, at least a decade or a couple of decades, even from the best practice of China and the other uh, Asian uh, success uh, examples that we have learned. So uh, if governments are changing every four years and five years, and one government succeeding the other government starts it all over again, and sometimes uh, takes it backward, uh, economic development is very difficult. So long-term planning is very important. The other one is there must be an absorptive capacity in the country for technology. So people have to be educated, as I said before. Uh, the infrastructure has to be ready. And uh, 
the technology has to mean something to the community and to the people right there. So they should be able to uh, operate that technology. Um, uh, the other uh, issue is uh, foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment should have a purpose. And that purpose uh, should be to create jobs, to create markets, uh, and to improve the livelihood of the people in that receiving country. So the policy framework, the regulatory framework has to ensure uh, this is in line. And of course, the investor has to be also adequately. Uh, today, uh, we, we've been talking about uh, capital in the developed world with negative interest, <laughs> right? With negative so, so interest yeah. rate. Yeah. But the developing world is lacking critical capital for investment, for uh, capital expenditure. So why are capital, why is capital sitting with negative interest here in the developed world while there is high rate of return in the developing world? This is just policy framework and regulatory uh, deficiencies. You've, you've talked about the regulatory framework, the long-term planning in Ethiopia, but as you said, you fly to 116 international destinations. Now I know Ethiopian Airlines is owned by the government, but on this panel, you are sort of representing an investor. And what do you look for in the countries that you fly to? Uh, a bit like um, Bruce Cleaver's list of things he likes to see before he commits capital to a country. Um, first, uh, an inducive and I mean conducive uh, regulatory framework for uh, investment to guarantee investment. Uh, most of the countries are signatories of these multilateral investment treaties, but how many of them exercise it, practice it in, in, in reality is a very uh, challenging question. So uh, investment guarantee is very important, uh, especially in less developed countries and least developed countries. The second one is rule of law and contract Which enforcement. Which you've heard before. Yeah, contract enforcement because you can sign a contract um, to invest millions of dollars in a country, but if you enter into dispute, a common dispute in uh, commerce and in business, and if the, tax, uh, if the courts take 10 years to resolve these uh, disputes, which is very common, uh, especially in our continent, uh, then the message goes around the world that you're not going to get uh, investors again. Uh, the second one is the financial system. So there must be a free flow of capital in and free flow of capital out. Otherwise, uh, investors will be discouraged. And the third is the labor, uh, labor regulation and also uh, the availability of trained and educated workforce uh, to support the investment. Uh, the labor um, uh, law of most countries in our continent is very uh, difficult for investors. Uh, of course, uh, you, the basic rights have to be respected, but at the same time, the investors uh, should have the flexibility to hire and fire as long as they follow the basic ILO, uh, International Labor Organization uh, regulations. So these are the some of the main uh, uh, conditions and requirements. Thank you. Um, Prime Minister uh, Lesotho, Mr. Tabane. <laughs> um, how will the new industrialization affect Lesotho's development path? And what strategies as a country do you have in place for meeting this challenge? I think it's quite interesting that both you and the uh, President of Botswana both talked about the lack of internet access, the lack of ICT structure in your country. So what, 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 what as a country, what coping strategies do you have? Yes, we, we are in a terribly and enviable situation of do or die. So to us, the, this debate is talking about something that is not an option, but a lifeline to our existence as people. 
if we do not adapt to change now while the opportunity exists, we shall disappear from the face of the earth. And that's not a prospect one wants to plan for. Lack of infrastructure and much needed technology and expertise to successfully adapt to rapidly evolving requirements is, is one of the things that, and also it is completely imperative to close the digital divide because if nothing is done with digitization, manufacturing, which is uh, our chief employer of labor in Lesotho, will relocate to where capital is, and that is not near customers with big markets to the chagrin of countries' development. Jobs will be lost, and wages will not be there. Cognizance that ICT and internet access are key building blocks of the digital economy. Lesotho has, over the years, implemented a number of policies and initiatives with the aim to improve the internet ecosystem and backbone infrastructure to reach uh, universal access and widen ICT, uh, to widen ICT literacy. Lesotho uh, established a convest sector regulator for telecommunications, broadcasting, and postal services, and one of the few successful universal service funds, USF, on the continent. The USF has supported the deployment of base stations to remote areas and provided mobile labs as well as facilitating connection of schools to the internet with a priority being to expand broadband to the rural areas in general. The government of Lesotho has also connected all the government offices to international, to, to the internet and network. The national uh, backbone and Backhaul networks have been extended across the country by two national networks. Network operators, Vodacom Lesotho and Econet Telecom Lesotho, both of them, of course, international companies, which have together rolled out extensive mobile networks with 3G coverage over 90% of the population. Lesotho also is proud that it is the first country in Africa I don't know if my other colleagues in Africa will agree, but this is what we think. <laughs> Standards-based uh, commercial 5G network. Although landlocked, Lesotho has benefited from connectivity to the landing of several submarine fiber optic cables on the, African, on the African east and west coast of the continent, which saw bandwidth quadruple in 2012. However, as indicated earlier, across to the internet in Lesotho remains low. The price of the devices and services constrains the uptake of non-users as well as the extent of use by users. With a view to nourish digital capabilities, IT has been put at the center of policies in the education sector. Consequently, some students in institutions of higher learning in Lesotho are developing innovative uh, applications, including those which can help to track thieves, develop virtual laboratories with, which allow students to perform some chemical experience on their cell phones, irrigate farms even when thousands of miles away. To name but a few examples, When I'm home, there's always a secretary to open these things. Now here, I'm on my own. Do you want me to help? <laughs> no, it's OK. I'm fine, OK. I'll sit here. We're also embarking on diversification of the economy with a view to more, to move higher value-added activities. Lesotho has had a success in attracting foreign investment in the textile and garment industry which remains the biggest employer in the country. However, other potential sectors for export diversification, including agro-processing, diamond beneficiation, tourism, have been identified, amongst others. Since these sectors are not highly susceptible to digitization, they would provide a window of opportunity for the Sutu, even in the digital era. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could now ask Ms. Garfez, uh, President of the United Nations General Assembly, um, in your speech you came out with a, a statistic, a billion people have no access to electricity. 
And then we've heard a lot from both uh, Lesotho and Botswana and other panel members about the importance of um, access to internet and telecommunications and technology. Um, what do you think needs to be done? What should be done? Again, we've heard there's a role for international agencies and a role for the developed world. So what should be done? What can be done? Well, thank you, Luis. And, and just to be brief, uh, I perhaps uh, would like to share, you know, three ideas. Uh, one uh, relates uh, okay. to the very important role that the United Nations uh, plays in this equation. I think that the United Nations is uh, well placed to become and to be a, a convener of uh, main stakeholders in order to really pursue a dialogue and also reach agreement and commitment on these very important issues, how to address the digital divide, uh, divide how to address um, uh, access uh, to the new uh, technologies. Indeed, I think that uh, the United Nations is doing um, a great deal. Uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres, uh, last July, he set up a high-level panel um, on uh, digital, co uh, digital cooperation uh, to ensure that there were uh, very concrete recommendations uh, for uh, global cooperation uh, among, um, among member states on, uh, on uh, um, the sharing of the digital space and the increasing of, uh, of consciousness about the transformative impact of uh, uh, technologies and new technologies in societal uh, architectures but also in the economy. Uh, we have uh, organizations such as UNCTAD itself, uh, our Department of Economic and Social Affairs, the ILO that are producing incredible, uh, very useful, great material uh, for us to reflect on. So that, that's uh, one important message, the very important convening role of the United Nations and the United Nations system. At the intergovernmental uh, level, last June, uh, the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations called for a meeting to discuss these very issues uh, with more than 1,000 attendants. And last week, I chaired myself a uh, General Assembly plenary uh, to look at uh, potential impacts and, and shortfalls, but also all the potentials of uh, Revolution uh, 4.0, as we, as we call it. And we had an, an incredible turnout from member states uh, starting to commit and to address these very important issues. And, and I would, so I, I think that uh, the United Nations can always do more and better, but we are actually taking this issue of frontier technologies and the sustainable development goals uh, very very seriously. Uh, the, the other, uh, perhaps two uh, key messages is one that, um, one that I forgot to, sp to speak Spanish. I, I'm speaking English, I just realized. <laughs> Beautiful English. Uh, well, uh, anyhow, but um, uh, since uh, I belong to a group uh, that uh, is, they're called Friends of, of Spanish and Multilingualism within the, the United Nations, I will switch into Spanish this okay. time. Uh, myself. Eh, y quería decir, um, What que I wanted to say la is revolución 4 the, the 4.0 eh, revolution, and I todos think los participantes all participants este panel in the panel agree on this, herramienta it is a powerful tool y, y el to empower de la Agenda 2030 and los fulfill de the implementation of the SDGs. It is a powerful tool to eradicate poverty, overcome inequalities, and strengthen alliances with the main stakeholders, and particularly the private sector and the investment sector. That is a fact. At the same time, it is a challenge. Más, eh, importante mensaje the es most que la tecnología no es neutral, perhaps, is that no es is not un aparato, neutral. una herramienta neutral. It is not a neutral tool. Eh, creo que es imperativo and entrar en un proceso de humanización 
de la tecnología, eh, la elaboración de un marco ético to have an ¿no? que establezca normas, reglas y acuerdos norms, en los usos de las nuevas tecnologías. Eh, se requiere una acción afirmativa There en favor del acceso a las nuevas tecnologías, for la transferencia de las nuevas te eh, tecnologías y eh, las estrategias de adaptación de nuestras economías y nuestras sociedades al uso de estas nuevas eh, tecnologías. Por ejemplo, en la emergencia de nuevos mercados laborales example, y la adaptación de los mercados laborales en el futuro. Of existing labor markets Les for the quiero future. dar un ejemplo. Vemos a las An nuevas example. tecnologías, por ejemplo, Looking para mejorar la productividad agrícola, vemos las nuevas tecnologías para eh, mejorar las tecnologías bajas en carbono y contribuir al cambio climático, pero también las nuevas tecnologías son herramientas para las armas letales autónomas. Eh, en inglés se les llama autonomous weapon systems, killer de la robots. guerra y las nuevas tecnologías. So, new technologies can be technologies of war, they kill faster. Y eso creo que nos hace un llamado claro so, a una reflexión ética del uso también de las nuevas tecnologías. Así es que, eh, pues, eh, dejo ahí mis comentarios por And ahora. I think I will leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I will now ask uh, Ms. Baron, President of the Inter-Parliamentary Union. In your speech, you talked about more egalitarian, more inclusive development. And again, we've heard that from other members of the panel, that you fear that communities, there are communities marginalized in the development and wealth. As uh, President of the Inter-Parliamentary Union, how can we ensure that we work together and no one is left behind? Thank you. Are you be speaking English or Spanish? English. Okay. <laughs> I believe it's going to be easier for all. Uh, well, at the Inter-Parliamentary Union, we're uh, aware of the responsibilities that we have as parliamentarians. So, first of all, we are clear that we have to ratify all international treaties, which, of course, affect or promote in, uh, uh, new technologies, the investments, etc. We're also responsible of translating those commitments and new commitments at the national level. We need to develop and change national legislation. Third, the most important public policy is budget. Sometimes we are not clear about the importance of budget, but it is. In Mexico, we say that true love is only reflected in budget. If your priority is not there, there is no love. So that's also very important to address uh, because at budget you're going to see how the public investments are going to be uh, assigned. And of course, oversight. We need to be asking questions to the government. We need to be sure that the, the objectives, the priorities of our countries are well reflected and implemented in all public policy. So, This is a huge task, but sometimes we are not aware of, our, of the consequences of our own decisions as parliamentarians. So I will put a, an example. I'm from Mexico, a country that has done a lot of reforms to precisely uh, have more investments. So for example, we did a telecommunications reform, and now we're having the most important uh, foreign direct investment into this uh, industry. So whatever you do in terms of regulatory framework is going to have a consequence into different markets. That's why this dialogue between public and private sector in all different levels from the global communities, national, and uh, hope one day we can include cities, for example, can make that a good step from uh, global commitments into local uh, 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 results. I believe that the best link to make these changes really happen is if we understand that if we want to change the world, we need to start from the communities. And as parliamentarians, we are representing that precisely people. We have constituencies, and if we take all this homework back to our districts, back to the communities, I'm sure that we are going to be able to develop results. 
And from the private sector, of course, it's the same. We need to work together with the communities because otherwise globalization is not going to be uh, useful for, for people. And that's what we need to, to change. Thank you. Um, and finally, um, the president of the World Economic Forum, Mr. Brenda, we've heard from a number of people in the, the, the panel about the potential threat of artificial intelligence, robots, roboticization, and other modern technologies about the threat that represents to jobs. Um, as sort of the head of the World Economic Forum, you sort of spearhead world leaders to discuss the latest challenges. So how do you see the WEF addressing this issue, the possible job losses resulting from these new technologies? And I think everyone's getting a little hungry. So if you could be re relatively brief, that would be great. Although it's a difficult question to be brief on. I do apologize. No, I, I, um, I don't want to uh, be the one stopping uh, people from enjoying their lunch. <laughs> um, one of my first jobs was being speechwriter for our prime minister. He was the former prime minister then, and he said that most politicians do end their speeches when people really have, would have liked them to end a long time ago. So <laughs> you should end, end um, when people want you to continue. I, I think that's a good rule uh, indeed. Uh, I'm, by the way, very impressed also with the examples we have seen here from the private sector. Look at uh, Ethiopia Airlines, what they have achieved uh, from Addis, a developing uh, country. Uh, world-class uh, airline, also now flying uh, on uh, Geneva. But even more important, if you look at Ethiopia, is a developing country, but they also created manufacturing in a country with scarce natural resources. Uh, they have hydro and no uh, utilizing that. But I think that's also partly answered to your question that um, even developing countries um, will have to apply uh, modern uh, technology and um, to uh, leapfrog. I think uh, there are very good examples of that. But modern technology can also transfer traditional uh, sectors like agriculture. So um, we just have to make sure that someone said that we don't, in a digitalized world, I think it was the Secretary General Fung that saying, in a, digital, a digitalized world, we, we don't have analog thinking among the policymakers um, too. So our contribution from the World Economic Forum is that uh, we are uh, already having um, four centers for the fourth industrial revolution uh, established because you also need traffic rules. Today, it's too much um, the, um, we're out without rules and protocols. So we should make sure that these new technologies do work uh, to the benefit of human mankind. And these technologies can be everything from precision medicine to AI, can um, contribute tremendously but it also can be the opposite. Look at what we're faced with in the cyber uh, sector, where we are seeing that 1,000 billion US dollars are lost every year in cyber crime. And no, I'm not talking about uh, cyber warfare. So, a um, lot to discuss. Uh, bon appétit. <laughs> bon appétit. Uh, Secretary General of UNCTAD, uh, Dr. Mukisa Kituya, uh, your closing statements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Today is United Nations Day. For 73 years, the UN has offered to bring deep and peace in the world, security, give shelter to the displaced, and host international consultation on how to include others in prosperity. So it's very appropriate for us that we are reflecting on how new technologies can help deal with lifelong challenges that were faced over the past 73 years. I'm very happy that you have given us an opportunity to convene to host these important consultations with such an eminent panel. Just two or three things I'd like to finish with. Can we mobilize the political attention to the critical agenda of digital inclusion? Close the gap for the developing countries. But also to emphasize again, 
e-commerce is a vehicle, it's not a product. Alibaba may move more than a million parcels a day, but the Chinese economy has to produce those millions of parcels for Alibaba to survive on that business. So we should not separate the possibilities of the digital economy from building productive capacity, from investing in livelihoods, from creating the value and services that the, the economy provides the means of delivering. At the end of the day, as Brenda said, you may order electronically, you may pay digitally, but that product will have to be physically delivered to the destination. So we have to see the synergies between building the infrastructure for a modern economy and the opportunities that electronic market visibility creates. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you.